Hello, my name is Dr. Andrew Misseldine, and I'm a mathematics professor at Southern Utah University. And this is my talk entitled Counting Sure Rings Over Cyclic Groups. Uh, to give some motivation on why we want to count sure rings in the first place, let me actually compare this to a comparable problem from combinatorics. Uh, the famous bell numbers are actually a sequence of numbers which counts the number of ways one can partition a set of n many elements, these so-called set partitions. Uh, the first couple terms in the sequence are given right here. Uh, these bell name numbers are named after Eric Bell, uh, whose picture you can see on the screen right there. Uh, to give you a visualization of what this means is, consider, consider a set of size of five elements right there. Now, it turns out there's gonna be 52 ways one could partition that. Well, one option is you put everything together. Uh, you could have everything isolated. So when you see no color on the dot, that means it's just a singleton. And you get things like this, where you put three things together, leave two apart, but you could decide on a different two elements, which would be isolated from the rest. And so this gives us a lot of possibilities here, uh, 52 for a five element set. Now related to the bell numbers are the so-called partition numbers, which the partition numbers count the number of integer partitions of a, of a non-negative integer n. And so by an integer partition, what I mean is something like the following. If we wanted to partition the number six, we could partition it as two plus two plus two, or we could write it as three plus three, or we could write it as three plus one plus one plus one. In other words, we're looking for any way, any, any all the possible sums of the number, the sum of positive integers. Now there's gonna be a lot fewer uh, integer partitions and there are set partitions for the same size. Uh, but the two things are related to each other. As you can see, we'll get to that in just a second here, but when you look at say the, par the integer partitions of five, uh, there are seven possibilities. There's just the number five itself, four plus one, three plus two, three plus one plus one, you get the idea here. And oftentimes these can be illustrated as young diagrams where the first row will be the first number, the second row, the number of squares there will be the second number involved here. And these are always written in descending order. Uh, now the two things are connected to each other because uh, the, the set partitions have a very natural equivalence relationship on them. We could actually say this is an isomorphism for set partitions because when one talks about a set isomorphism, that is just a bijection, the only thing that's left invariant by all possible bijections is really the cardinality of the set. And so if we look at set partitions and only focus on their cardinalities, we can associate to each partition one of these Young diagrams. Uh, so for example, we get uh, partitions over here where you put two together, two together, and, and one together. And so you get this right here. So all of these different partitions as set partitions are isomorphic and can be identified with a single integer partition. Um, I should also mention, so like the integer partitions, the integer numbers count the number of isomorphism classes there are of the set partitions, which are counted by the bell numbers. The, the number of classes is counted by the partition numbers. And then if you are curious, the number of elements in each class, those are counted by the Sterling numbers of the second kind. And so there are some classic uh, combinatorial number sequences used to analyze these questions about partitions. So what I wanna talk about today is what if we wanna change this question to focus on finite groups? Uh, what can we do to start counting partitions of groups? Well, the first thing to, to kind of nail down here is that if we want to start enumerating partitions of groups, what does it mean to have a partition of a group? Um, we, we need a partition because the group itself is a set, but with a, with a binary operation, our partitions should have some respect of the binary operation in play here. Otherwise, it's just a set partition. Now, there actually is a notion of a group partition, which in the category of groups, it's the partition object. And that involves uh, covering a group using subgroups of that group and so that they intersect in trivial ways. Uh, so there is a notion there. and It seems like a strong candidate of what we want to be talking about right here. But this idea of group partition is actually a very rare uh, phenomenon. Like you can do it for Fabrinius groups. Uh, but, and others, I, I think as well, but it, it doesn't happen that often. Like for example, a cyclic group could not be covered using proper subgroups. It's not possible. 
um, at least not in a, yeah, you can't do it with proper subgroups. And so that type of partition where the cells themselves are subgroups, you got to do something else than that. Now, some partitions that do kind of respect the group structure that might be of interest counting here is take the, the equivalency of conjugates, right? Two elements are in the same class if they're conjugates of each other. This is a very important partition of the group. Uh, another equivalent relationship could just be automorphisms in general, uh, a sort of a, a stronger uh, relation than the conjugacy one. We could pair things together based upon their inverses, uh, involutions being by themselves. We could partition a group using cosets or double cosets if it's a non-normal group. Uh, we could talk about membership of a subgroup, like we could partition the group by you belong to this cell if you're in the subgroup and you part you belong to this other cell if you're not part of the subgroup. And so these just, just give us a few examples of some partitions. These are going to be set partitions that in some, in some way or another, the set partition is measuring some part of the algebraic structure of the group. Now, all of these that you see on the screen right now are examples of a special type of partition called a sure partition, or more likely called a sure ring. Um, these are named after Isai Sure, who first kind of came up with the idea. And they're called sure rings as opposed to sure partitions because the because these objects are genuine rings, subrings inside of the group algebra associated to the group. And let me kind of explain how that is. If we have some finite group G, um, we can identify subsets of the group with elements of the, of the group algebra QG. And these are called simple quantities where you basically just add together all the elements inside the subset via the formal sum of the group ring. And that becomes this simple quantity in the group. Uh, an, another bit of notation here, if we take a subset or an element of the group ring, it doesn't really matter which one we do, if we raise it to this negative one power inside the parentheses right here, what this means is we're going to be just taking the inverse of each element uh, inside that set there. And so then with this bit of notation in this convention in hand, we can define the notion of a sure ring. So a sure ring, you start off with a partition of the group. And this partition will make a submodule of the group ring. We just take the subspace spanned by all of these simple quantities. But then to make it a sure ring, there's three extra conditions required. First, that one of the classes in the partition must be the group identity element all by itself. The second uh, condition is that given any class in the partition, its inverse class must also belong to the partition. And then finally, if you take the product of any two classes in our partition, uh, the product will be a linear combination of other, of other classes in the partition. So when you look at these things, three things together, right, we're looking for a partition which has an identity, which has inverses, and which is closed under multiplication. Um, the, the, the multiplication in play here will always be associative. So we're looking for partitions that mimic the group axioms themselves. And so these partitions are very group-like objects. And this is what we call a sure ring. And so to give you an example, a few examples of sure rings here, uh, one simple example is what we call the discrete sure ring. And this is just you take the entire group and you partition into singletons. So the group itself is a sure ring. And so if we take the cyclic group of order six, we can partition it by just taking um, everything by itself. You see different colors for the different cells. Uh, on the other extreme, we can take what we call the indiscrete sure ring, for which the identity is by itself because it has to be, and then everything else is fused together. Again, looking at the cyclic group of order six, you have the identity by itself, and then everyone else is in one very large class. We can build partitions using automorphisms. Um, if we have an automorphism, a subgroup of the automorphism group, it acts on the group via that automorphic action. And then the orbits associated to that group action form what we call an automorphic sure ring. So for example, if you take the cyclic group of order seven and you take uh, powers of two, which is an automorphism, you get the following three celled uh, automorphic sure ring. As another example, we can actually form sure rings using the direct product structure of the group. If we have a sure ring over, uh, if we have a direct factor, so G factors as H times K here. If you have a sure ring over H and a sure ring over K, then you can take the tensor product of those two things and that'll form a sure ring 
over the direct product. Let me call this the direct product sure ring. So if you take Z6 again, take just take uh, the subgroups Z2 and Z3. Uh, and so if we take a sure ring over Z2 and a sure ring, which you can see right here, and a sure ring over Z3, which you can see right here, take the, all the possible products, you get this direct product sure ring. And then as a final example here, uh, let's consider the, well, we can actually build sure rings using uh, quotients of some kind, normal subgroups. So if we have a, a su normal subgroup of some kind, H inside of G, then take a sure ring over H and take a sure ring over G mod H. And then there's a, it's possible that we can kind of glue these two sure rings together to make a sure ring over the, the group G. And it's going to involve using cosets of the quotient. And so if you were to identify the five our five points set before, if we identify those points as the five complex roots of unity, then those of those 52 partitions, only three of them will actually correspond to sure ring partitions. We have the indiscrete one right here. We have the discrete one right here. And then lastly, uh, we have the this one right here. This is an automorphic one where you identify inverses together. So these, these four types of sure rings I've mentioned so far uh, constitute what we call the traditional sure rings. And it was shown in the 90s by Lung and Mon that all sure rings over cyclic groups are traditional. They're one of these four types. And so if one wanted to try to count uh, all the possible sure rings over a cyclic group, it would be very, very difficult to try to go through all the partitions and decide this one's a sure ring, this one's not. Because there's just they, that, that's the, the number of sure ring, uh, the number of partitions just grows too rapidly. So we need a different approach of deciding which of finding which partitions form sure rings over the group. And the two big things that one has to deal with here is that the direct the direct product and the wedge product constructions is a recursive a recursive construction based upon proper subgroups. So we have to grapple that recursion. And then also we have to be able to list the in, in decomposable sure rings over a group. That is those sure rings which cannot be written as a direct product or wedge product of any kind. And in this talk, I really want to focus on this in decomposable problem because the recursion here can get a little bit crazy and we're limited on time. And so I want to present just some examples here. How does one decide, uh, how does one find the in decomposable sure rings uh, for a group. Well, the, ind the indiscrete sure ring always offers one and all the other ones are going to be automorphic ones. And there's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the automorphic sure rings and subgroups of the automorphism group for a cyclic group. And so one has to study the automorphic subgroups of said group. So if you take, for example, Z5, its, aut its automorphic group is a, is a cyclic group order Z4. And you're going to see that the subgroups of Z4 are going to look like the following. Well, just by divisors, you get 1, 2, and 4. When you go up to the automorphism group for 5 squared, that's going to give you Z20. And you're going to get all the subgroups you had before, but you're also going to gain um, some new subgroups, Z5, Z10, Z20. And these are just going to end up stacking on top of each other. If you look for the subgroups, of Z10, which is the automorphism, sorry, Z100, which is the automorphism group of Z125, you're just gonna get these layers that just start stacking on top of each other, isomorphic to each other as lattices. And you see this happening over and over again. Um, if we looked at, for example, Z7, its automorphism group is gonna look like Z6. It's the cyclic group of just P minus one. If you take this layer right here and you copy on top of it, you get, you get the automorphism lattice for Z or for seven squared and for seven cubed. Same thing for 13. The base la layer here is gonna look like the divisor lattice for P minus one. And then we stack on top of it lattice isomorphic copies of that. And so very rec recursively, we can see very clearly what the automorphism groups for cyclic groups are gonna be when it's a power of an odd prime. And so if we take omega n to be the number of sure rings over the cyclic group Zn, we can then, well, for an odd prime, let x be the number of divisors of p minus n. That, that's sort of this base case when it came to that, the lattice at the bottom here. Uh, we can then, using the recursion that comes from the wedge products and the recursion from that automorphic lattice we saw on the screen a little bit ago, one can actually pull apart a recursive formula for omega pn um, it'll depend on previous uh, omega p n minus ones, 
This number X shows up a lot here. Again, the number of divisors of P minus one. And then also the, re the recursive relation brings out the Catalan numbers, which is sort of an interesting argument uh, that I can't really go into right now. The Catalan number is a very famous number, very famous number sequence in combinatorics. Um, if we were then to expound that recursive formula, we see the first 10 um, iterations of that formula would be these 10 polynomials. Um, and some interesting things we can say about these polynomials, they're always monic, the leading coefficient's one. Um, the last coefficient, the constant term's always, this follows the Fibonacci sequence, kind of, which is kind of fun. Um, and just some other things to mention that this actually shows that the number of sure rings over a, uh, uh, a cyclic group of order PDN actually is a pork function. And so this is kind of resemblant of Higman's pork conjecture that when one starts counting the counting groups, non-isomorphic groups of order P to the N, uh, you have these polynomial over residue class functions. Turns out that sure rings over cyclic P groups are also pork. Uh, which is kind of a nice con connection there. And if you plug in some specific numbers, you can see here's a table of number of sure rings for various powers of primes. Um, if we were to look like at power of two, so two, this has to be treated dif differently as it's this even prime. When you look at the growth of the automorphic lattice, uh, you see that when you get to eight, it starts to stabilize, that you get this little this little V-shape that appears on each time. It didn't, because this group itself is not cyclic, it's not a cyclic group like the previous ones were, so it's a little bit more complicated, but you can see that as the power of two increases, you can, you can predict how this automorphism lattice is gonna grow as well. And as such, you can use that to come up with the following formula. Uh, this one's a whole lot more complicated, uh, as you can kind of see here, as compared to the previous one. Some things to note, it is, it is recursive, right? Omega two to the N does depend on previous uh, omega values for powers of two. We're looking at the proper subgroups of this group here. It also relies on the Catalan numbers, but it also, it also the, the Schroeder numbers come out here, another important number sequence that's uh, actually closely related to the Catalan numbers. Uh, the Catalan numbers come back again. This is mostly coming from the recursion from the wedge products involved. Um, for, for P to the end, there are no direct products possible, uh, but because of the non-cyclic nature of the this this lattice of automorphisms, there is these Schroeder numbers that come into play. So these things can get complicated pretty quickly. And again, if you look at specific powers of two, uh, you get the following sequence of numbers. So what if we want to look at counting the number of sure rings when the order has multiple prime divisors? Uh, well, a natural candidate, you know, a sort of a simple example would be look at Z15 here. If we try to look at the, well, for Z15, you are gonna have direct products, you're gonna have wedge products, but we wanna figure out those indecomposable ones. How many automorphic ones can we have? Well, the automorphism, the automorphic group, the automorphism group for Z15 is gonna be Z2 cross Z4. So let's say the generator of Z2 is A and the generator of Z4 is B like this. Then the lattice is gonna look something like the following. We can look at the subgroup of Z4, you'll have a, the trivial one, Z2, Z4. If you look at the group associated to Z2, you just get the trivial subgroup and Z2 itself. And when you take the direct product of the lattice, you get the following uh, parallelogram-like shape. This gives us six distinct subgroups, which will give us six distinct automorphic Schur rings, but the group has two extra subgroups, these so-called diagonal subgroups. Uh, they get their name uh, because of where they kind of appear inside of this lattice right here. Now, these diagonal subgroups come about from the following idea. A is an element of order two and B squared is an element of order two. If we multiply these things together, we'll get an element of order two. And same thing when we put together A and B, B has order four, A has order two. When you multiply them together, you get a, a group of order four right there. And so by multi, in an abelian group, if you multiply together elements of similar orders, uh, you can create new elements that are outside of this lattice. And so this kind of becomes a tricky thing, predicting when you take a direct product of abelian groups, how many subgroups will you have? This is actually a very sophisticated problem. And the, the, the complete answer is actually not known yet. Um, turns out we only know a little bit about this formula of counting subgroups of general abelian groups. Now, if you use that, you can apply that and get the following formula right here. This this equa this part of the equation right here, if we're counting 
If we're counting the number of sure rings whose order is a semi-prime, that is a product of two distinct primes, then we get this right here. This is going to count the automorphisms, uh, which comes down to counting uh, all of the subgroups of the automorphism subgroup. Uh, we also have to count the wedge products right here. And then lastly, we want to count the, the indiscrete or sometimes called the trivial sure ring. There are direct products in this situation. It turns out every direct product is an automorphic one. You don't have to count them twice. Now, in order to get this form, which is a little bit complicated here, it does use uh, Euler's totion function, and it has to do with how does the prime decompose. Uh, so if you if you write your prime with a, its sort of quote-unquote prime factorization, if you subtract one from a prime, it's no longer a prime, right? What's the prime factorization of P minus one? That affects these this formula here. And if you look at the at this table, this gives you just data for all these possible sure rings right here. Uh, there's we we don't need to look at all of this here. Uh, one last example I want to I want to mention here is that what if we looked at the lattice associated to four p four times a prime here? This is kind of a nice uh, predictable lattice here because if we take the lattice of just ZP, you're going to get the trivial subgroup at the bottom plus something. You know, what is this, some blob going on right there? I uh, don't know exactly what it looked like, but if we want to take the, the automorphism group, the lattice associated to the automorphism group of Z4P, well, you're going to get the lattice for Z2, which comes from the Z4 part. You're going to get the lattice associated to ZP, which is, again, this blob. And when you take the direct product, you're going to get this, this isomorphic lattice picture on top, like there's this bottom layer, and then there's this top layer that as lattices, they're going to look identical to each other. But then you also have these diagonal subgroups that sit in the middle here. And so if you want to count the sure rings uh, of the cyclic group of order 4P, there's going to be some, you have to watch out for these diagonals here. It turns out it's not so, it's not so wicked in the situation of 4P. And so as another, as another kind of result here, if we decompose our prime as 2Ka plus 1, uh, so we're trying to figure out how many multiples of 2 divide into 2 uh, p minus 1. That's the, that factor of 2 is really going to measure how many diagonal subgroups we're going to have. And so when we put this together, we get a cute little formula. <laughs> Compared to most of the formulas we've seen in this talk here, this one definitely is the cutest one here. Um, and I should, should mention that uh, these results, uh, you, it was mentioned on the slides here, but these results, uh, the first couple about uh, just the single single primes, right, P to the N, 2 to the N, uh, these were results uh, proven by myself uh, in, in, in a paper published in, earlier this year, 2020. Uh, the, these last couple results about the, the semi-prime P times Q um, and this 4P case you can see on the screen here, uh, this was joint work of myself with also two undergraduate students at Southern Utah University, Joseph Keller and Max Sullivan, uh, for which at the time of this recording, these results will be published forthcoming, uh, probably 2021, uh, assuming people will <laughs> referee uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, but we'll, we, we can make the projection that that preprint will be published uh, sometime next year. And so again, here's some numbers based upon that. Uh, if, if you have, if you apply that formula to the various four times P cases there. And so finally, just if we kind of just have some last, last minute questions right here, uh, the techniques we've developed in this, again, we were very, very quick and we didn't talk about a lot of the recursion, uh, but in order to, in order to enumerate these sure ring partitions, uh, it really, we have to be able to understand these we have to be able to predict how many indecomposable sure rings there's going to be. And this has a lot to do with the number of subgroups of the automorphism subgroup of an abelian group. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is still a very open question. Uh, we're using the so-called rank two problem associated to counting subgroups in an abelian group, uh, where it's just, a, it's just a product of two uh, cyclic groups there. Uh, P, we, we can assume they're P groups. Uh, and there, there is work that's done for the rank three um, I, th I think the rank three problem might have been solved. Uh, I have to double check myself before I could say that definitely. The rank four problem for counting subgroups in a abelian group, I believe, is still quite open. And so, in terms of counting uh, sure rings over cyclic groups, one's not going to be able to get any farther than the the the, the rank the subgroup counting problem. Uh, 
because uh, that's going to be a subset of this larger problem we're in right now. And so at the sort of at the moment, at the time of this recording, the idea would be to be trying to carry this up to finish the rank two problem for these sure rings over cyclic groups. Uh, you know, arbitrary order of P to the N times Q to the N. Can we get a formula for all of those? And I think there's really good hope of getting such a thing, but um, it's, it's still a little far off. And then you could also ask, well, what if you start getting more, right? Just because uh, the general uh, rank in problem hasn't been solved for counting subgroups and revealing groups, there are special cases we could do. Like what if there's no repeated primes? Uh, what if there's like PQR? R, P, you know, R just, if you have R many different primes, could we approach something like that as well? And of course, it's also natural, can we start looking at other types of groups other than cyclic groups? The problem there is that the cyclic groups are the only groups that have really a complete classification of all the sure rings over them. Uh, even for small groups, there are tons of partitions possible, and therefore there's potentially a lot of sure rings that could be done. And we still have very kind of little knowledge on what type of shurings can appear for even even abelian groups uh, it's still a very very unknown thing which has some important applications uh, one very important application would have to do with super character theory uh, theories because a super character theory for example uh, this is when you start gluing together characters of a group and you form character theoretic like objects that we call these the super character theories and it was shown by hendrickson that super character theories correspond to central sure rings of the group. And so be able to classify uh, sure rings is essentially the same problem as trying to classify super character theories. And there are other applications of sure rings with algebraic combinatorics that I won't go into uh, in this talk right now. So that, that finishes this talk. I appreciate everyone for watching it here. I should mention that a lot of the images uh, in this talk, if they weren't made by myself, uh, they were borrowed from Wikipedia, so like some of the some of the pictures of, of Bell and sure, obviously I, di I didn't draw those ones. Uh, though those are courtesy of Wikipedia. If you have any questions on these topics, feel free to uh, comment in the comments below. Right, if you like what you saw, give it a give it a, give it a like, click. Or again, if you want to have a more in depth conversation about sure rings and topics related to that, feel free to send me an email. Uh, or again, just kind of reach out to me through the comments on this uh, on this YouTube video. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great day.